Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jeffrey Cohen, the Dean of Humanities here in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. As Dean, I oversee three humanities schools with more than 360 faculty members and 4,201 undergraduates majoring in everything from history, philosophy, literature, and an array of languages to linguistics, religion, creative writing, and film and media, among many others. But our mission is wider than our number of majors. This fall semester, we have filled 26,000 seats in our various humanities classes. Students from across the university study with us. A great many of these students are enrolled in our writing program, which is under the innovative and inspiring directorship of Kyle Jensen. Our numerous writing classes ensure that students have an integrated undergraduate experience regardless of their major, engaging pressing social questions that ensure that they participate in civic life from day one at ASU. The Common Read program, which Dr. Jensen has introduced this year, accomplishes these goals admirably while focusing on good writing, keen analysis, and deep learning on a topic important, important to the whole of the university. This year, the focus is on sustainability and climate change, which could not be more timely. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. I thank the dedicated staff of the English department for making all of this work, and the amazing instructors of the writing program for ensuring the success of every one of their students. But most of all, I thank our students themselves who in typical ASU fashion have taken this opportunity to think deeply about the future and run with it. So grab some vegetarian snacks and get ready for a powerful conversation. I hope that you will enjoy our evening with renowned author Jonathan Safran Fower in conversation with writing programs director Kyle Jensen and some of our students. Over to you too. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thanks are due to you for your incredible leadership. Uh, this project uh, and this particular topic was launched in one of our first conversations together. We sat down and I asked you the question, what should we be talking about as a college? And you said, we need to address the question of how to live sustainably in an era of climate change. And that was the catalyst for this program. And you have been an incredible sponsor uh, for this work uh, since that time. And so we're very grateful for your leadership. I also want to thank Provost Searle, who I understand is in the audience this evening. He's encouraged this event from the beginning and has been a champion of ASU's access mission. So thank you, Provost Searle, for your, uh, for, your, uh, for your work and service to this university. Thanks are due to our department chair, Chris Ratcliffe, for her support and her ongoing encouragement, as well as Kristen LaRue and Bruce Matsunaga for their exceptional work behind the scenes for this event. Thank you, too, to Macmillan Publishers, who have made arranging this event a truly rewarding experience. We can't think of a better partner. But mostly, and let me echo uh, Jeffrey's sentiments, thanks are due to our teachers and the students whom we serve, who have responded to these unprecedented circumstances uh, with characteristic resilience, uh, integrity, and ingenuity. I'm so proud of the work that we've done this year, and we have great work still to come on the horizon. Finally, of course, Thank you to Jonathan for meeting us this evening. Uh, you'll find that I have, you'll find as I have that his immense abilities as a writer are eclipsed only by his generosity. Before we begin, I just wanna talk a little bit about the mechanics of this evening. Uh, our conversation will last until about 7.30. Uh, I will ask nine or so questions that are based on questions that ASU uh, writing program students submitted to me after reading We Are the Weather. Then I will turn it over to individual students who will ask questions directly to Jonathan, um, and that, that will take up the rest of the event. Due to time constraints, unfortunately, there will not be an opportunity for a live Q&A session afterwards, and the chat will be disabled just so we can focus on the conversation. That being said, Jonathan, are you ready to go? I am ready. All yeah. right. Well, we're so excited you're here. Um, we have audience members tuning in from all over the world, learning at various grade levels. Some of them have read We Are the Weather in its entirety, and some of them are just wading into the book. So to get on the same page, maybe you could just give a brief synopsis of the book and explain to us, why do we need to be reading We Are the Weather right now? Um, well, let me begin by saying thank you for um, choosing my book for this uh, one read program. You know, we're, as anybody who watched the debate 
two nights ago. Was it two nights ago or was it <laughs> yeah, my nightmare it last night? I can't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it will never stop happening now that it uh, just started. But, you know, watching it was singularly depressing, regardless of what your politics are, because we're facing such truly profound and truly urgent problems, problems of a size that they can't be solved by half of the people. Um, we need to find ways to share perspectives, um, even when the perspectives are quite different. And we need to find a kind of humility that we're not accustomed to, that we've um, almost, um, it's almost as if we grew out of it by accident. And these One Community, One Read programs or One Book programs are the perfect antidote to what we witnessed a couple of nights ago. And um, they're also the antidote, or at least at the beginning, to the solution to um, these large problems that we face, climate change being foremost among them. So I'm grateful and excited, of course, that, that you read my book, but even more than that, I'm just happy to be with almost a thousand of you right now um, in conversation. I will happily share my perspective, even when it's embarrassing um, even when it's filled with doubt, as it very often is. Um, and I look forward to hearing your perspectives. Um, it's a shame I'm not there. That was the original plan. The and plan, obviously yeah. COVID got in the way. Um, but I thought uh, th there will certainly be nice things about interacting in this way as well. But I wanted to just situate you, um, you know, where I am. Um, I am in my son's bedroom right now can have a little look around. There's uh, some choice stickers that he has on his wall, some various other doodads. And I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it was probably in the low 70s today. We in New York are used to experiencing it as either too hot or too cold. And then there's a sweet spot of about five or 10 days a year when it feels just right. And today happens to have been one of those days that was just right. Um, and it's a little bit later here for me than it is for you. It's about 9.15. So, um, for people who haven't read the book, what is the book about? The, the obvious and easy description of the book is that it's about the relationship between food and climate change, in particular animal products. I can tell you that I did not set out to write that book and I don't think of this book that way. Um, I set out not because of an argument that I wanted to make or some kind of conclusion that I'd reached that I wanted to share and persuade others of, but because of a struggle that I felt inside of myself. And not only felt, but I, I began to witness myself feeling, which is something a little bit different. Yeah. There's an old saying, um, or it's a, I suppose it's more like a joke that once upon a time, there was a person whose life was so good, there's no story to tell about it. Um, stories, whether they are novels or nonfiction arise out of, at least for me, and I can't think of actually a counterexample, um, arise out of a discomfort. You know, something isn't right. There's a friction, there's something that's unresolved, there's a lack of peace. And I felt a lack of peace um, regarding climate change and, and especially the question of what it is to be an individual in this moment of climate crisis. I, like you and like everybody here tonight, have known about climate change for quite a while. Um, I don't know that there's anybody in the United States who could claim ignorance of what the scientists are saying. And as it turns out, there are very, very few people who don't uh, accept what the scientists are saying. Um, the great majority of Americans not only accept what the scientists tell us, they wanted the United States to remain in the Paris Climate Accords. That's including a majority of Republicans. So this is often cast as a divisive issue, as a partisan issue. It really isn't one. But there is a division, I think, inside of us, or at least that I've felt inside of me, between the person who knows these things and believes that he cares about them. I tell myself I care about them, and I spend a lot of time telling other people that I care about them. A division between that person and the person who makes choices on a daily basis. I have found it very, very difficult to make choices that are in keeping with what I know and what I feel. So at a certain point, the witnessing of that internal division became such a large 
problem for me that there was a story to tell about it. And that in story, you know, involves some amount of scientific research, some amount of journalism, but it's ultimately a very personal story um, about trying to close the distance um, as all of us always are between the person I imagine myself being and the person I actually am. Yeah. That's a great answer. So it sounds to me like writing for you is a tool that helps you work out those kind of internal conflicts. So we have a lot of students who are just picking up writing, you know, uh, in higher education for the first time. Um, what advice would you give them? Like, how do you confront those really difficult conflicting moments in your writing process? And how do you work to resolve them? Especially when there is, as you said, that gap between I know what I ought to be doing, but when I measure that knowledge against my lived experience, there seems to be a certain amount of incongruity. How, how does one write through that process with the level of courage that you seem to have in We Are the Weather? So I, I, I actually came to writing a little bit later in life. I mean, I was still very, very young when I wrote my first book, but it, it, it was not the kind of culmination of a dream or a process. It never occurred to me that I would be a writer when I was um, in high school or even through the first few years of college. I was not a huge reader when I was young. I didn't keep diaries. Um, I was not the kind of kid who has a flashlight and a book under the covers uh, after bedtime. I watched enormous amounts of TV when I was a kid with my older brother in what in retrospect was an impressively laissez-faire uh, environment. And um, I came to writing not so much because of a love of literature per se, but because of a love of what literature could do for me, um, a love of it as a vehicle rather than a destination. And what it could do for me was allow me to be sensitive to my concerns. You know, um, life doesn't offer us a lot of occasions to be sensitive to our concerns. And so they either continue to concern us in an unresolved way, and usually in an insidious, very, very subtle way. Um, um, or we, you know, pu push them to the side, um, which does a harm to us. You know, it's, it's not good to live um, with a lot of lack of peace or irresolution. So I like the way that, um, you know, certain kinds of en environments, whether they're physical um, and spatial or temporal or emotional, they, they create a context for a kind of thought and feeling. So, you know, if you've ever walked into like a beautiful church or any kind of house of worship, like, you're inclined to have a certain kind of thought and feeling. It's almost impossible not to. It's very hard to go into Notre Dame and think about um, how you really need to order some more recycling bags when you get home. And um, conversely, it's hard to go into a McDonald's and have lofty thoughts about the meaning of being a person. Um, you know, therapy is a certain kind of context for some people that um, allows, that, that wants to be filled by a kind of self-examination that wouldn't happen in other places. Listening to music or encountering art is a context to have a certain experience or feeling that you wouldn't otherwise have. So it matters what kind of rooms we put ourselves in and it matters what kind of people we surround ourselves by because they determine who we are allowed to be or who, who we, the kind of, you know, our personhood. So writing for me is like a room um, and it gives me time and space um, to reflect on what it is that I care about, what my concerns are. And it forces me to articulate them rather than just, um, be vague, you know, before we have, before we can articulate what it is that we think and feel, I think it's, it's really hard to get those thoughts and feelings right. 
There's, I once read an essay by a linguist about the creation of modern Hebrew and how there wasn't a word for frustrated until like the 1970s. And so this linguist argued Israelis were never frustrated <laughs> in the 1970s because, you know, you'd be driving in the car with your partner and your partner says, what's wrong? And you search your little mental dictionary of emotions and you think, I don't know, I guess I'm pissed or I'm cranky or I'm angry. And then you become pissed and cranky and angry. And so having a word not only allows you to like describe to somebody else what you're feeling, but it allows you to feel it in the first place. And writing is a real gift in exactly that way. It allows you to, we're used to the idea that writing allows you to communicate something to somebody else. But more important than that is it allows you to have those thoughts and feelings in the first place. So my advice, um, first of all, would be that everybody should write. Um, the world doesn't necessarily need more novels, but it needs more writers, for sure. More people who are creating time and space to work out their concerns. And um, for people who want to, I think as you're suggesting, like take it more seriously, maybe as a profession, um, it, it's hard, it's hard um, to think of any advice other than um, nobody's right and nobody's wrong about whether writing is, piece of writing is good, yeah. but, but you are right about whether it expresses you yeah. accurately. And um, I guess at the end of the day, and not all writers are this way, but the, the, the purpose of writing has at least something to do with expressing oneself accurately. Yeah, that's really great advice. I, that's great. So when you reflect on your composing process uh, with We Are The Weather, and you look back and say, what is, what is the thing that you're most proud of having written? And you talk about writing as an exercise and accurately articulating what it is you feel or creating spaces to allow yourself to feel. What was the thing that was really difficult to write? Or what is one thing that you feel like, I'm really glad that I took the time to work that out? That's a, a great, great question. Um, I think that the, there's a chapter in the book that's a dialogue with myself. Yeah. And I found it difficult to write because I found it humiliating. And, you know, I said in the beginning that it's, it's not as if I had an argument to make. I, I didn't. I didn't achieve some sort of enlightenment that I just wanted to share with other people. Just the opposite. I felt really stuck. Mm -hmm. I felt stuck in my own hypocrisy and I felt stuck in my own laziness and um, weakness. And um, that was my starting point. And I wanted to find a way to share that, find a productive way to share that, a way that would be both productive for me and also productive for a future reader um, and that required um, a, being honest in a way that made me very uncomfortable but that I was I was glad that I did that's great and how have audiences received the book obviously it was published a little over a year ago um, do you have any pleasantly surprising stories where audience members have expressed the impact that that vulnerability may have had to help them take the step toward making changes in how they eat or how they draw the connection between what they know and what they actually act upon. Um, well, I have no idea what a year is, so <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I lost track of that. Anyway, suspended. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you had said, you know, your book, which came out 20 years ago, I think I would have just nodded and believed you. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not, in a way, I'm not the right person to ask because it's like a self-selecting audience that would ever meet me. People come to readings because they want to, not because they don't want to. Nobody comes up to me, or I should say, it's extraordinarily rare, but it happens every now and then, to say, hey, you're a jerk and your book sucks. You know, if someone may, goes to the trouble of attending on Zoom, they might just do that because you can do it from the comfort of your bed. So I'm sure at least a couple hundred of you are saying to yourselves right now, <laughs> your book sucks and you're a jerk. But 
in person, you know, because you have to make the effort to go to a reading, um, I, I really only meet people who are, who are generous um, or who have a generous response to the book. I meet an enormous number of people who tell me, oh, I became a vegetarian. Um, I have become a vegetarian myself probably 20 times in my life. So I know that it's, it's not as grand a statement as it sounds. Um, Mark Twain once said that quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world to do. I've done it 30 times. Uh, <laughs> vegetarianism is easy in the same way that quitting smoking is easy. What's very difficult is to sustain a choice, especially when it's a choice that has to work against some of your other values or some of your cravings and when it has to work against cultural norms. So that, that's tricky. Becoming a vegetarian is easy. Um, and it's funny because my response to that statement, oh, I read your book and I became a vegetarian has really changed over time. A few years ago, when eating animals came out, if somebody would say that to me, I'd, I'd probably just like hug them and say, hey, that's terrific. And then I'd go home feeling good about myself. Now I have a slightly different response, which is um, to ask the person if, if they're sure that that's the best thing for them. And what I mean is not to discourage anybody from responding to the catastrophe of animal agriculture in America, but is the, is the identity the thing that you want? You know, what, what is motivating, what motivated that decision? I think for most people, um, whether you become a vegetarian or not, I think there you, the values of wanting to reduce the amount of destruction in the world and wanting to reduce the amount of violence in the world, I think those are universal values. They're not, um, they're not um, vegetarians don't have any kind of claim to those values. Um, so if that's the goal, what's the best way to achieve that goal? Um, there are ways to set oneself up for success and ways to set oneself up for failure. So if someone says to me, read your book, I've been a vegetarian for three weeks, going strong. You know, I, I think that's great, but I, I also worry because that person, especially if they have no experience with a big change in their diet, which is a diet is more than just a diet. It's has to do with your uh, upbringing, your personal history, religion for a lot of people, culture, the way you socialize, not to mention your cravings in your body. Um, so it, it can be very difficult. And most people are going to, to revert to eat meat at some point. I have done it like 20 times in my life, become a vegetarian and stopped being a vegetarian. So then what happens? If you say, I've been a vegetarian for three weeks, and then let's say that's about 60 meals, give or take. Does that math sound right to you? <laughs> Seven days Sounds a week, right? right. Yeah, Let's say 60, okay. You're so asking you went, me, professor, so. Yeah, so 60 meals, I've been doing it. And then on the 61st meal, you have a burger. So then what? Well, then you're not a vegetarian anymore. Then you failed. But if instead the approach is, okay, I wanna act on these values that I have of I'm wanting to reduce the amount of destruction and, and violence as much as I can. So I'm gonna eat as little meat as possible. And then you get it right 60 out of 61 times, people would hoist you on their shoulders and say, you're the world champion of good eating, you know, because it's, it's, even though it's like a subtle distinction, it's a distinction that makes a huge difference, which is framing your decision um, in terms of an identity or framing it in terms of goals. And in this book and in my life, I prefer to think about it in terms of goals, even if the outcome is exactly the same. Right. Even if, you know, I'm somebody who eats as little meat as possible and that amount is zero. That's still different than being a vegetarian. Sure. So can we talk a little bit about your op-ed that you published earlier this, this spring, this past spring? So obviously COVID-19 has irrevocably altered public life. Uh, and in that op-ed, that you published in May, you drew a direct connection between COVID-19 and meat consumption, going so far as to say that COVID-19 kicked open the door and has forced us to look really hard at the impact of our meat consumption. That was almost six months ago. Uh, have your views 
on the issue changed at all? And do you see glimmers of hope on the horizon now that we're really in the thick of COVID-19? Um, I don't think we're really in the thick of COVID-19, unfortunately. I think that um, we are soon to be in, in the thick of COVID-19 and we've had this period of a lull, which is maybe, um, I know speaking for myself, I've largely forgotten what it was like in April and in May when um, daily life was um, not only my habits, but my like emotions were so guided by fear and sadness. Mm -hmm. Now it's a kind of a, a noise among other noises, um, but I worry that it's going to become a kind of dominating presence again. Um, you know, one of the, good side effects of this period and as tragic as it has been and as much as we all wished it never happened there are some positive side effects and one is it's compelled us to think about what's necessary and what's essential um, that word essential has actually sort of been on the tips of a lot a lot of people's tongues um, beginning with the question of essential workers you know why is it that the guy who delivers my um, Thai food is essential, but a my kid's school teacher is not essential. Why on earth is it that somebody who works in a meat processing plant, which were for several weeks the um, most dangerous COVID hotspots in the country, um, workers who refused to work and were compelled to work either by their bosses, or ultimately Trump. Um, why is that essential? I can, I can easily understand. I have no problem understanding because I sympathize with people who would say, well, I want to eat meat. I, I get that. I totally understand why someone would want to order it off a menu among options of meals or why somebody it's important to somebody on a holiday like Thanksgiving or the 4th of July or why there are, um, you know, a, a so really strong associations with um, family or groups of friends. I don't understand somebody who says it's so essential that we're going to put other people's lives right. at risk. And we were in a um, period in March, April, and May when that's exactly what we were doing, and we were doing it knowingly. We we're forcing workers to to go back into the meat processing plants. The other thing that we know. Um, is that uh, this is according to the Center for Disease Control, three out of four new and emerging epidemics arise on factory farms. You know, they are breeding grounds for these pandemics. And it just makes perfect sense if you think about it. You know, the coronavirus was originally, I don't know if you remember this in the first weeks referred to as the novel coronavirus. And um, novel um, means it's new to humans that it had existed in animals, but that breed hadn't existed in humans. And viruses disregard um, you know, political boundaries. If it's in China, it's gonna be in Germany, it's gonna be in the United States. Um, I can keep myself safe in New York, but if it's in Arizona, it's gonna to come to New York and, and vice versa, as it did. Um, similarly, they don't, respect species boundaries. So if they exist, if a virus exists in chickens, in all great likelihood, it will at some point exist in us. Hence bird flu, hence swine flu. So imagine if your governor right now said, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what the citizens of Arizona are gonna do um, about COVID. We're gonna pack people by the thousand in high school gymnasiums, and we're going to turn off the ventilation. We're going to um, artificially um, create lighting cycles that confuse you as to what's day and night so that you'll work harder and be more productive. And if you're getting sick, don't worry about it. We're going to give you antibiotics to prop you up. You would say that's not only crazy, it's literally exactly the wrong thing to do. Right. What we need to do is socially distance ourselves from each other, give each other more, not less medical attention, um, and um, 
sacrifice um, work output in the interest of being healthy. And um, factory farms, which didn't exist about 75 years ago and came into prominence, into dominance in America about 40 years ago, uh, are the uh, exact opposite of what most of us imagine when we imagine farming. Most of us imagine like a guy with the pitchfork and overalls and standing on grass and animals walking around outside. And this farmer probably knows the animals by name. And they're kept in by a picket fence and um, the farmer loves the land and leaves it in better shape than he found it. And that is not a myth. That's real. There always were farmers like that and there still are farmers like that. Unfortunately, they've been completely dominated by the factory farm system, which now um, produces 99.9% of the animals that we eat in America and has not only decimated the environment and decimated our, our universal regard for animals, but um, has destroyed farmers. You know, we have fewer farmers in America today. I don't mean per capita, but as a real number, we have fewer farmers than we did during the Civil War even though our population has doubled 11 times. So, um, we, you know, we have these farms that are producing food that at the cash register seems to be historically cheap, but is actually historically expensive um, because of all of the subsidies, either in the form of corn and soy subsidies or um, not holding companies, farm corporations responsible for environmental destruction. And um, they are making us, making our bodies sick and making our minds sick. And um, this is not, you know, there's a way of talking about meat and a future for meat that is not... Um, anybody wagging a finger at anybody else. It's not anybody shaming anybody else or saying this is evil. But I think we all do have to agree that the system that dominates American agriculture now is one of the best examples of evil that we have going. Yeah. Well, following up with that last comment, um, one of the, you know, synop the brief synopsis under the title of your op-ed reads, if you care about the working poor, about racial justice, about climate change, you have to stop eating animals. Can you, you know, for, for people who are new to this argument, could you just explain what is, what is the relationship between poverty, racial justice, and climate change? Um, so I think a, a good place to begin is by dismantling a myth about meat eating and vegetarianism, which is that any serious discussion of how much meat we eat and where it comes from is elitist. That's always, in my experience, the first response mm. to any attempt to just talk about it. Um, and nothing could be further from the truth. And it's a, a story that was um, created by the meat lobby um, and, and perpetuated by the meat lobby. So um, people, Americans who make less than $35,000 a year, are three and a half times more likely to be vegetarian than people who make more than $75,000 a year. Um, people of color are disproportionately vegetarian. And um, Harvard Medical School did a, a study in 2019 and found that it's $750 a year cheaper to be a vegetarian than to be a meat eater. So it's not true that it's too expensive for people to consider, just the opposite. It's not true that it's you know, only a privileged white person's concern. It's a concern for people who care about animal welfare, care about the environment, care about farmers. And as it turns out, people of color, at least in their actions, care more than others. Um, you know, meat packing plants have always had the most dangerous jobs in America, um, highest rates of injury. Um, and now with COVID, this has been highlighted in, in a way that we're not accustomed to, but they were the uh, most egregious hotspots in America, COVID hotspots. Um, factory farming has stolen 
many things from us, one of which is um, both a culture of food and access to food. So, you know, McDonald's and Burger Kings have replaced supermarkets in inner cities. And America has a um, really tragic problem with urban food deserts where people have um, um, lower income families have no access to foods except for fast food, which we know is both um, a financial drain, even though it might seem cheap, it's far more expensive than going to a grocery store and being able to buy ingredients and cook food. Um, and it is miserable for our bodies. And one of the reasons why uh, people of color have diabetes and heart disease and cancer at a higher rate than white people in America. Um, so that, that's that. All right. So as you were talking and you, and you mentioned this a, a little bit earlier in, in one of your previous answers about how unbearably cruel factory farming is to animal life. We've been talking about climate change, poverty and racial justice. Obviously we've been experiencing a lot of really bracing accounts of cruelty uh, to underrepresented cultural groups, um, underrepresented classes. Do you think our country is addicted to cruelty? And do you sense a reasonable sense of fatigue in those who dedicate their lives to combating uh, the relationship between climate change, poverty, and racial injustice? I don't think that we are addicted to cruelty. I think that we are addicted to certain ways of living that require cruelty. Um, in the case of food, you can certainly eat meat without cruelty. Okay, a lot of people would actually disagree with what I just said. Um, I, 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 the way that I approach this is actually not from um, a, the perspective that it's always wrong to kill an animal for food. Um, I actually don't want to partake in that myself, but I have been to farms um, and there aren't very many of them, but I've been to them and I know that they exist. I've seen it with my own eyes where the animals are treated very well. They are allowed to engage in all of their species specific behaviors. They were not um, bred to grow so big that their body weight would literally crush their own bones if they're not slaughtered in their adolescence. And um, they are killed at the end of their lives in a way that they don't anticipate and almost always don't feel. So, you know, it becomes a little bit of a philosophically weird thought experiment, but it's almost impossible not to conduct it, to wonder if I were an animal, if I were a cow, would I rather have that existence or would I rather never to have been born? Mm -hmm. And I visited a number of farms where I thought I would choose this existence. I probably would. Um, we can't feed 7 billion people meat every day, much less twice or three times a day without inflicting incredible cruelty. Mm -hmm. um, there are some who would say we can't have a system of animal agriculture without having systematized cruelty. You know, if you were to ask me, can I imagine a situation in which it would be a good thing to give a job to a 12 year old? Of course I can. I can imagine somebody who's impoverished where having a reasonably well-paying, reasonably safe job employed by a beneficent employer might allow that kid to live and maybe even allow his family to stay together and be healthy. Does that make me an advocate of child welfare? Of course not. I'm not an advocate of child welfare because anytime you scale a system where the power dynamic is so imbalanced, where one party is so defenseless relative to the other, they will be abused. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of people who would argue a system where we are raising animals to kill them, to eat their bodies, uh, is one of the most extreme power imbalances that exists, and it will always be abused um, when you scale it. It's not to say that all farmers are bad because it's just not true. There are plenty of very, very good farmers. But when you scale it, that will happen. To me, that's a theoretical question and it's not really important to get too deeply into. 
The important thing is we live on a planet with 7 billion people and a population that's growing parabolically and the planet's not getting any bigger. It's just staying the same size and it will always stay this size. So resources are becoming more and more finite. It takes between six and 26 calories put into an animal to get one calorie out. Um, there's probably a time in human history when that was okay, but it's not okay anymore. There are 150 million children in the world under the age of five who are physically stunted because of malnutrition. Imagine if every citizen of England and France was a child under five physically stunted because of malnutrition. That's the situation that we have. And we are partaking in the most inefficient kind of eating that we possibly could, um, which is also the most destructive kind of eating that we could. Um, animal agriculture is, according to the UN, one of the top two or three causes of every significant environmental problem on the planet, locally and globally. Air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, loss of biodiversity um, and greenhouse gas emissions. According to the IPCC, which is now like the gold standard for climate science, mm -hmm. um, we have no hope of meeting the goals of the Paris Climate Accords, which 70% of Americans want to meet. Um, even if we do everything else, even if we stop flying and stop driving, if we don't change radically, change um, the amount of meat that we eat. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to respond to that information, a lot of respectable ways. I, I think that it is not deserving of respect to say it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, this is not my opinion and it's not the opinion of a scientist. It is scientific consensus. Um, I actually would respect somebody who said, that's true and I can't do it. I, I know myself, I know my history. I want to do it, I just can't do it. I have huge respect for that because I know firsthand how difficult right. it can be. Um, we don't need to, there isn't one it that we need to do. You know, it's not the case that we all need to become vegetarians tomorrow. We do need to live with far greater moderation and um, to return to your original question, are we addicted to cruelty? No, but I, I, I do think we have a real problem with moderation and it's, it's kind of baked into America. You know, the American dream is to have more than your parents had. That's that as far as I know is the definition of the American dream, but we can't do that forever. Mm -hmm. We can't always have more. Um, we need to find a way to be satisfied. Um, and even more than that, we need to find a way to accept less. So, you know, one of the side effects of not being able to accept less is causing destruction and cruelty. So when we um, spoke earlier this week, I asked you what you thought about the first presidential debate and specifically President Trump's claim, they want to take out the cows. I suggested that it would probably be better to just stay away from partisan politics. And you mentioned this in one of your earlier answers. You replied that taking out the cows is not a partisan issue. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, Elizabeth Warren, who is at the far, far other end of the political spectrum. Trump and Warren might be our, the ends of our political spectrum. When she was running for president, she, very often she would stand up and say, we're not going to take away your burgers. You know, um, it's the cow is a sacred cow. It's like in America, we don't want to talk about that. Um, and I get it. And I get why it's makes people feel vulnerable or defensive. The problem is there is not a single person that I know of who is talking about taking away anybody's cows. You know, what they, what Warren and Trump are doing is speaking in hyperbole. They're fear mongering. Sure. They are doing um, the, the, the lowest form of, it's the lowest form of leadership, which is rather than guiding um, people toward a truth, 
whether it's a difficult truth or an easy truth, they are um, exaggerating um, in the interest of eliciting uh, strong emotions for personal benefit. So um, nobody is saying, let's get rid of cows. I'm not saying let's get rid of cows. Um, climate scientists aren't saying let's get rid of cows. It might be worth getting specific about what we are talking about. I, I would have much preferred Elizabeth Warren to say, nobody's going to take away your hamburger, but we right. do have to talk about hamburgers. Right. You know, um, There is a middle ground and there is an approach that I think people would be open to. Um, and in my experience, they are open to. It just has to be handled not bombastically, but delicately as these problems, um, as, as would befit the problems that we're talking about. Um, so the most comprehensive analysis of the relationship between animal agriculture and the climate was um, published at the end of 2018 in Nature magazine. And the authors, um, the scientists studied food systems all over the planet and found that while there are places where um, people aren't getting enough calories and where animal agriculture is really their only access to food, to those calories, um, those people could eat a little bit more meat and dairy than they do now. People who live in Europe, the United Kingdom and the US need to reduce meat consumption by about 90% and dairy consumption by about 60% in order to um, avoid what they called irreversible climate collapse. So that sounds like a lot, you know. Um, it's worth noting that they didn't say everyone has to become a vegetarian. And it's worth noting that that sounds like a lot. Um, if I were to ask the, you know, thousand people online right now, hey, what do you think about coming a veg becoming a vegetarian tomorrow? My guess is almost all of them would say, no thanks, or it's just not, it's just not gonna happen nice as it might sound. If I were to say, what do you say you eat 90% less meat and 60% less dairy? I think most people would say about the same thing. If I were to say, what if we made this a 10 year project? Can you imagine eating 9% less meat this year over the course of the year? So can you imagine, um, you know, one out of 10 meals when you would have eaten meat? So I don't know how, how many dinners the average person eats meat, maybe two out of three something like that. But let's just say three out of three. You know? Can you imagine twice a week not eating meat when you would have eaten meat? Just as a starting point, instead of like worrying about what the final step would be. And, that, and this is actually what Elizabeth Warren and Trump were doing. They raced right to the end. And that end, which is a caricature, takes so many different forms that we've all heard. It's the same end as like, but don't you hear the carrots crying? Or what happens if you step on an ant? You know, or does this mean we're gonna have to all wear um, bed sheets around because clothing is bad for the environment? Well, like that's not where we are. You know, rather than beginning at the final step, the question is, where do we begin? You know, and if some people can begin very ambitiously and some people need to begin more modestly, when it comes to food, I can be pretty ambitious. When it comes to flying, I can't. Yeah. And I could pretend otherwise, but we, we really are past the point of pretending. Yeah. We need to figure this out. So if I say to somebody, listen, here's where we are, here's what the science is, and here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, I, I, I believe I can pretty easily refrain from meat. I don't think I'm gonna have a lot of luck refraining from flying. That person says to me, hey, that's funny because I never get on airplanes, but I eat meat every day. So I'm just the opposite of you. I hope that person could respect where I'm coming from. I hope that I could respect where that person's coming from, but I also hope that we will be rigorous about the limits that we're admitting to. So if somebody says, yeah, maybe I, maybe I could not eat meat for lunch you know i could respond by saying for lunch that's it 
Don't you realize what's going on? Are you unaware of the fires in California? Are you unaware of the superstorms constantly pounding the East Coast? Are you unaware of the melting ice sheets? Are you unaware of, you know, species extinction and so on and so forth? Or I could say, that sounds like a pretty great start, um, knowing that once people start, they continue. Right. You know? People who, who don't do anything continue to not do anything. People who start to make steps in the direction of their values tend to make more and more and more steps. So, but then that person has to do what he or she is saying. And if they say my limit is only lunch, okay, but then you have to do that. Right. That's great. So in keeping with, with your line of thinking there, a number of students wrote to me wondering about how your family has responded to this shift in, in your meat consumption. And as I read between the lines, I'm thinking that they are reasonably concerned that their families might be upset or even reject them if they make the ty types of changes that you propose. Do you have any advice for those students who really want to um, follow your recommendations, eat less meat, maybe just once a meal, you know, during a week or, but then fear. Well, once a meal would be a lot. Uh, sure. Sorry, I missed. <laughs> so, uh, or like, you know, one meal every week. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm just kidding. So uh, what, you advice would you, what, what advice would you give people? them? Well, I would say like, first of all, proselytizing annoys people. Um, and it doesn't work. You know, I became a vegetarian for the first time when I was nine. And um, it was not because anybody made an argument to me. I had a babysitter who just didn't eat the fried chicken that my older brother and I were eating. She didn't say, don't you realize what that is? She didn't give me a lecture. She didn't make me feel guilty or ashamed. She just didn't eat it. And I was naturally curious. And I said, why aren't you eating? And um, she said, I don't want to harm animals um, unless it's absolutely necessary. And I found that unbelievably compelling as a nine-year-old. And I have to say, I still find it unbelievably compelling. Um, we live in a country where 96% of us think that animals deserve legal protection from cruelty. I'm not sure that there is a more universal American value than animal protection, odd as that might sound. Um, in any case, I think the best way to persuade people is not to try to persuade them, but to model your own choices. Like people are aware of the choices that we make now more than ever for better and for worse, mostly for worse. Um, if you become a vegetarian tomorrow, Google will know, Apple will know, um, Facebook will know, it, it will be noted. And, and that noting will actually matter in terms of how to handle it with your family so that you don't alienate them, I think there's a lot of different approaches. And I mean, it's so specific to the family and, and the situation. I think a lot of times you can share your struggle. You know, not like, I'm not going to eat that because, but you know, like dad or mom, that looks amazing. Like, I wish I could eat that. Um, I'm doing my best to like, eat less. I'm seeing how it goes, seeing how I feel, seeing if I'm able to do this. But um, science and the environment are really important to me. And I, I'm, I'm trying. And I don't judge you. How could I judge you when I've been doing it my whole life? You know, I don't judge you. I'm not trying to persuade you to be like me. Um, but I'm asking you to understand that this is important to me. Yeah. I think if it's like approached with humility instead of self-righteousness, there's every reason to think it should go over fine. Are you ready to answer um, some questions from our students? Sure. All right. So Reina Gallegos is up first. Um, we're going to try and get her connected up so she can ask her question. Let's see. There she is. See, Raina, you're, you're muted if you're um, speaking. We can't hear you quite yet. 
My apologies. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, Jonathan. My name is Reina Gallegos, and I'm majoring in social work uh, at ASU. My English 102 class was one of the first classes to read your book, We Are the Weather, Saving the Planet, Begins at Breakfast as part of ASU's common read for the English department. For our final project, I discussed a concept for a community program geared towards elementary school age children about sustainability and nutrition actions and initiatives for marginalized communities. My project suggested that community programs that focused on these discussions early in life could help young learners develop and understanding of the importance of reducing our animal protein intake. In your experience, what action or leadership have you observed as successful or not so successful with a program such as this one? Can you share any suggestions that one could, one could apply to a program such as this one? Um. Well, thank you for that question and thank you for what you're doing. I think that seems like the absolute best of all approaches, frankly, to this problem. Um, young people find it much easier to change than older people do for obvious reasons, like their habits aren't as ingrained, you know? Kids who are born not eating a lot of meat don't desire to eat a lot of meat. People like me desire to eat a lot of meat um, because I ate it throughout my whole childhood and through a lot of the rest of my life. And so I developed not only a taste for it, but also, you know, a million associations. Um, the only experience that I've had with the kind of program you're talking about is through um, an organization called Edible Schoolyard that started in Berkeley with Alice Waters, um, where they would um, go into public schools in the community and take over a portion of the playground, very small portion, um, and rip up the asphalt and plant a garden. And they would farm that garden with the kids and they would talk about the kinds of issues that you were mentioning. And they would also cook the food with them because one of the things, one of the many things that um, factory farming has taken from us is like the uh, a memory of cooking like in a value of cooking, one third of the meals that we eat in America now are eaten in a car. It's just crazy when you think about why that's the case and what that does to us. You know, the dinner table used to be the place where families got to know each other. People got to know each other, where kids learn to, you know, do, do their first public speaking, do their first arguing, do their first thinking through problems. It's where values were transmitted and now we're eating food with the fingers of one hand and in cars. Um, we think of mealtime as something to get out of the way as quickly as possible. I wish so badly that we had home ec again in our school system. I think that it is um, every bit as important as math, science, and English um, teaching kids um, how to function, not only tools for their minds to function in the world, but um, skills having to do with our daily lives. And food is at the very, very center of that. You know, learning about where food comes from. I didn't learn that at all when I was a kid. Uh, learning how it's farmed, learning about how farming has changed, learning about how you can grow things for yourself learning about nutrition, you know, there's almost no um, nutritional education for young people. And what education there is, is brought to us by primarily by meat and dairy lobbies um, who have turned the USDA into a like largely useless organization that promotes lies about nutrition. Um, like we need to eat meat in order to get enough protein, when in fact vegetarians eat almost twice the recommended daily allowance of protein, or that we need milk for strong bones when the countries that um, consume the least dairy have the lowest rates of osteoporosis, like Japan. Um, so we need honest nutritional information 
And we need to have reinstilled the value of food, whether it's growing food or cooking food or the kinds of stories we tell about food um, and sharing food with one another. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Raina. Uh, next up, we have Eric Unsworth. Can we get him connected to ask his question? And be sure to unmute your mic, Eric. I, I'm, I'm here. Great. Um, yeah. So I have uh, a hard time as myself putting my, my faith in a large group of unorganized masses as opposed to like legislation or people in charge. So um, do you think that, how effective do you think the US government will be at addressing climate change in the, few, in the coming years? And is, if they're not effective, is collective action on our part our last best hope? Well, I agree with you that um, legislated change would be more powerful and more efficient. So in theory, I also believe in it more than I believe in the, in the power of individuals to do what needs to be done. But who are the legislators that you believe in? You know, um, there's nothing, there's no more important act as an environmentalist than voting. That will be more powerful than the sum of all of the changes you make in your lives. But you need someone to vote for. You need somebody who is going to enact or even attempt to enact the values that you have with regard to the environment. So I don't trust that there is such a politician out there right now. Um, there's certainly like better and worse, but the better is not going to get us anywhere where we need to be in anywhere near the amount of time. Um, but there are other ways to create systemic change than just voting and marching. And, um, I think that in a way, the distinction between individual action and systemic change is, is false. You know, um, Tesla is now the largest automobile company in the history of the United States, not because they were legislated into being and not because Elon Musk is such a beautiful human being, but because people wanted cars that were going to be less environmentally destructive. So there was an appetite that he has fulfilled, satiated. Um, Beyond Meat, which makes the Beyond Burger, had one of the most successful IPOs in the last 10 years, the American stock market, not because they were legislated into being, um, but because people wanted it. So as we want these things, and as Google and Apple and Facebook know that we want them, and Amazon know that we want them, what's offered to us changes. And as what is offered to us changes, it becomes easier to make good ecological choices, which makes it easier for corporations to provide those alternatives to us. And it becomes a, a kind of virtuous cycle. And politicians are a part of that virtuous cycle. As we demand for them to have greener policies, they will have greener policies, which will empower us to demand more, which will allow them to provide more. Um, so, um, I, I agree with you, but I don't want to sit on my hands and wait for a political savior. Good question, Eric. That's great. All right. Up next, we have Ali Villanueva. Um, can we get Ali connected? Kyle, is that your home kitchen behind you? Yeah. It's like, the, it's like a hockey rink. <laughs> Enormous. <laughs> How many people are you cooking for? Uh, we cook all our meals at home, so we have got a lot of little mouths to feed. <laughs> hi, Allie. Hi. Hi, Mr. Fower, and hi, Mr. Jensen. Um, my question, you kind of ended up answering it, but uh, my question is, what do you think about the Green New Deal's uh, plan to address climate change? And since you kind of already addressed it, what exactly do you think could be changed to make it more effective? Um, so I could pretend that I know more about it than I do, but I won't, <laughs> you know, I think that it's an incredible and important step forward. And I think it's actually possible. It, Biden's plan deviates a little bit from it, but the spirit, the Green New Deal, it's like um, one of those things where once it was spoken aloud, it was, it was very difficult to, to 
break through the membrane um, of legislating for the environment. But once it became part of the cultural conversation, there's really no going back. And now everybody is legislating in response to it. Um, and it's not, by the way, the only important environmental legislation out there right now, like um, Cory Booker and, and Elizabeth Warren, who has made clear that she won't take our hamburgers out of our hands. They've actually um, created legislation to dismantle the factory farm system, um, which is very exciting and I think would be a wonderful first step. But you know, the thing that comes even before that, before creating new laws would be enforcing the laws that we already have on the books. Um, Smithfield is one of the largest meat producers in the United States. In one year, they had more than 8,000 violations of the Clean Water Act, a law. Uh, if they had had 20 violations, we would say, it's not so good, but they're a huge company, it happens. If they'd had 200, we would say, you know, somebody's really got to keep an eye on these guys. But 8,000 is a business model. Yeah. But that's a plan. It's not an accident. And it's a business model because it's good business for them, but it's very bad business for us. Um, they are not footing the bill of the environmental cleanup, but somebody is. And it's us, and it's our kids, and it's our grandkids. So I think an, a, an extraordinarily powerful first step would be to enforce the environmental laws that are already on the books and to try to, you know, it's funny, like conservatives and Republicans are very, very resistant often to creating additional taxes, environmental taxes. Um, I don't agree, but I sympathize. I understand that position. Um, but what if instead we aimed for a free market solution where things cost what they actually cost, you know? I understand why somebody would say, I don't want you to put a, an $18 tax on my hamburger. I get it. But why is the government paying in effect $18 to factory farm corporations to produce hamburgers? Because that's exactly what's happening because of the subsidies and because of not holding them responsible for their environmental destruction. If all we did was say, let's just, we don't need to punish anybody for eating meat. We don't need to make anybody feel bad about it, but let's just have it cost what it actually costs, you know? And if it turns out that that actual cost feels too expensive to most people, that's because it is too expensive. Um, so I think this comes back to this point that I've tried to make a number of times that there are different ways of telling the same story. You know, there's the way of saying, I'm going to make your hamburgers cost $20. So you eat fewer of them. And then there's the other way, which is these things already cost $20. You know, we could admit to it and try to confront that reality, which by the way, would allow smaller farmers who are farming in ways that we actually respect it would allow them to start to catch up um, because that playing field is so slanted against them right now. Um, but, you know, I think that version of telling the story is something that a lot of people who might otherwise be resistant could get on board for. Good question, Allie. Yeah. All right, we have Brianna McMillian up next. Can we get her connected? Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good. Thank you for this evening. It's good. Great. How have you changed your diet and lifestyle since writing We Are the Weather? In the book, you mentioned that you hadn't yet cut out dairy and eggs completely. Have you done so now? Um, no, I haven't. I, um, you know, again, like I could, I could tell you a version that's, that sounds better, which is like, I almost have. And I am far more conscientious about it. And I, um, but you know, I'll tell you the honest to God truth because what the hell, here we are. Like today around lunchtime, I found myself making a quesadilla and it had cheese in it. And my girlfriend was in the room and I said, saving the planet begins at breakfast, huh? And I said, man, I'm so lazy. She said, you're not so lazy. And I said, no, 
there's something wrong with me. And I wasn't saying it in a jokey or self-deprecating way. I think all of us have to admit that. Like, there's just something wrong with us that, I mean, maybe wrong isn't exactly the right word because it's, it's unfairly judgmental. There's something human about us that we just, it's not as easy as saying, I know this is right. I'm going to do it. You should do it. Um, I think there's a place for making such statements, but at the end of the day, the planet doesn't care what we say and it doesn't care what we feel. It, what matters is what we do. So I, my honest answer to you is I find it to be difficult and um, inexplicably difficult. It, it almost like dumbfounds me the fact that I, I haven't found it to be easier at this point. Um, I can tell you that with each passing day, I felt more sure about who I want to be. And I felt more sure about what I want to do. Um, but one of the things I've grown to appreciate is that changing is not going to be an event for me. It's going to be a process. I spent a lot of my life believing it would be an event and not understanding why the event didn't quite work. Um, and now I, I know it, that's not the kind of person that I am. Some people are like that and I applaud them and I am a little bit jealous of them, but I'm not like that. Um, it's a process, it's a struggle. Um, I bet you we could have this conversation 40 years from now and I would probably still be somewhere in, in the struggle, but I hope that I will be, um, you know, fighting hard in that struggle and somewhat closer to where I want to be. The, my kids have a much easier time than I do. And this, this returns to um, the young woman who was talking about the program that she's working on, which sounded so great to me. Um, it is easier for younger people to change. You, Brianna, are quite a bit younger than I am. It's easier for you to change um, than it is for me. 25% of college students describe themselves as vegetarian leaning, whatever the hell that means. There are more um, vegetarians than Catholics on American college campuses now. Um, you guys are the people that both matter most and are most able to matter. This is not my way of excusing myself from the struggle. Um, I'm being honest about where I am in it. And part of where I am in it is um, um, I, I am eager, really eager for you guys to graduate and become leaders. Um, the problem is it, that will be just in the nick of time. You know, I'm not even sure we have that much time. Um, if you were to ask me, do I think that we're going to solve the climate crisis? I feel 100% sure we will. I just am not at all sure we're going to solve it in time. Um, so we need to, um, I remember watching a video once of a, an Olympic sprinter and he was training and they had this new like training technique where they attached a kind of, um, wire, a rope to his back, to the back of his belt and something from the starting line would push him and they knew how fast he could run hundred meters and it would push him just a little bit faster than that you know, then he could will himself to run. So he was on the verge of being out of control, but he could do it. I think that's, that's kind of where we need to be. We need to recognize what our limits are and do our best to exceed them a little bit. Great question. All right, up next we have Jeffrey Smith. Hi, um, I don't know why um, my camera is not working. Um, That's right, we can hear you just look like that. All right, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I look that bad today, but uh, who knows. <laughs> all right, Mr. Foyer, uh, I have just one question for you. Um, here it is. Um, environmental scientists have offered their findings based on founded research to the public of the imminent danger our environment faces in terms of continual degrad degradation um yet generally spoken we continue to ignore the warnings along with the consequences uh the world entered enforced isolation from each other uh shutting down import export travel 
um, all in the face of a pandemic, COVID-19. Yet as we sit back on our hands and hope someone else saves the day, we watch our environment burn a little more every day. Um, my question then being, why is the populist reaction to COVID during this pandemic so much more prominent than any movement we've really ever made to protect our environment in recent memory? Why do you think? Um, to be completely honest, I just think um, we're too selfish uh, that we care more about what's going on in our daily lives than to see the bigger picture and what's going on in the world. I agree with you. Um, I think that we've responded as we have to COVID because we're afraid for ourselves. Um, you know, imagine if Trump had said, we're going to shut down the economy and close schools. Otherwise, people in Bangladesh are going to get coronavirus. We would, the country would have been like, what, are you kidding me? Yeah. Imagine if Trump had said, I need everybody to wash their hands like really well. Otherwise, people in Bangladesh are going to get coronavirus. I don't even think most people would wash their hands really well. Um, <laughs> I don't know that that's because humans are evil um, or uncaring. I think that we evolved over the course of millions of years to care about what's local to us. Um, you know, our ancestors did not have the luxury of thinking far into the future, and they didn't have uh, the need or ability to think about people who are outside of their immediate vicinity. And that is how our hearts and our minds evolved. That is who we are. And it's great to try to overcome it. And we need to try to overcome it, but we also need to recognize our own limitations. The problem is climate change requires a leap of empathy. We can't solve the problem only by worrying about ourselves. So what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to do? If we just can't muster the right thoughts and feelings um, to, to motivate us to do what needs to be done. So Jeff, are you still there? Yes. Okay. Um, when you go to a store and there's something that you want, tell me like what the process is inside of you that leads you to, to buy it rather than steal it? Um, I mean, there's legal consequences if you get caught, and then there's the moral consequences of having that on your mind. And do you think about those things every time you're in a store? Um, not usually. Yeah, me neither. I don't think about it at all. I don't have any conversation with myself. <laughs> I don't need to like have a memory of the social contract. I don't need to have any kind of welling of emotions when I think about taking money out of the store, you know, the shop owner's pocket. I don't need to think about a fear of being arrested. Um, even if all of those things are inside of me, I just don't steal because I just don't steal. Like I, I sort of maybe exhausted all of those conversations in myself a long time ago, or maybe I've inherited this like norm, but there's no interior monologue. There's no debate within myself. There's no wrestling. I just don't do it because I just don't do it. And we need to find ways to shape ourselves into people who just don't steal from the planet and who just don't steal from the future. If we are always depending on empathy or if we're always depending on a kind of ethical imagination, we're gonna just, we're gonna fail. And, and not because we're bad, but because we're human. If instead we, you know, this is one of the reasons why I think having a plan can be really effective. Like instead of saying, all right, yeah, I'm gonna try to fly less or yeah, I'm gonna try to eat a little less meat search yourself and think about what's possible. You know, for me, I can't stop flying, but I did make a vow that I wouldn't fly for vacations in 2020. Little did I realize how easy that would be. <laughs> uh, I did make that vow to myself. If I hadn't made the vow, summer break would have come and I would have thought, okay, what am I going to do? Well, I probably shouldn't fly. On the other hand, God, we haven't flown in a while and 
I'd really love to get to like some different weather and I want to show my kids this place they've never been to. And seeing the world is, is like an ethically good thing to do, to have your perspective expanded and to realize that your way of being is so narrow, you know, in, in relative to all of the ways of being that exist. This is the problem is that we have to choose against things that we like and that are good um, unless we don't choose. You know, so if I have a plan and I say, I'm just not going to fly for vacations in 2020, then come summertime, it's just not even a debate. I, 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 this is who I am. I've said it to myself. I've written it down on a piece of paper and I've told it to other people, which I think is also very important to have witnesses for this plan. Um, so we need, we need to have plans. And I would really strongly encourage you to have one. To write, you know, to write it down, to just think about it. You know, what can I do? Not in terms of what beliefs can I have, but what actions can I take? And to give it like days of the week and to give it numbers and to tape it to like your front door, tape it to your refrigerator, let other people see it, talk to them about their plans. And I think by doing that, we can relieve the burden of, of having to overcome our own humanity which I don't think we will ultimately be able to do. Um, but instead we become more automatic about doing the right thing. That's awesome. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your answer. Thank you. Thanks for your question. So I think we have time for one more question um, from Ashton Lump. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Can. Hi. I just want to say uh, thank you for talking to us this evening. I really like. I really want to thank you for this book. It really resonated with me quite a bit. Um, I also wanted to say, in regards to your book, I noticed that throughout most of the sections in the book, you make uh, many analogies and provide information that initially doesn't sound prevalent to the topic of the climate crisis, and then very abruptly towards the end of most of these sections, bring together these topics with very uh, bold claims regarding the climate crisis. I want to ask um, why it was you decided to structure the book this way? And um, how did you come to the conclusion that um, this method would be more effective than others in getting your points across? Uh, I don't know that I did decide that, but I don't know that it is more effective. I think it's my way of telling the story. And... Um, I always feel doomed as a writer if I'm not doing it my way. Um, it doesn't mean that I think it's going to be a good book or as you said, an effective book, but it will be my book. It will be what I have to contribute. Um, I decided right from the beginning that I wanted the book to be personal and I wanted it to be about my thought process. Um, I'm not a journalist. I'm definitely not a scientist. Um, but I am the expert of me, you know? And um, I, I think that I, I know that a lot of people have been experiencing their own versions of this struggle that I've been experiencing, um, which is what am I supposed to do? What is a person supposed to do right now? And I, when I decided that I wanted the book to be personal, um, I made this choice to have it be a reflection of my thought process as I moved through um, these questions. Now, obviously, I, I'm a writer. I'm a professional writer. And I, I wouldn't pretend to be naive about that. I knew that I would write it. And I knew that it would be published. And I knew that people would read it. I also have an editor who helps me to shape my thought process into something that's accessible and useful. Um, so it's not as simple as what you read was just sort of how I thought about it, but I bet it's more similar to that than you think. Um, it sounds like you're imagining that I had some sort of, that it was a strategy, uh, a literary strategy, and it, it really wasn't. Um, I, I, you know, I've read a lot of books about climate change. I've seen a lot of documentaries about climate change. I've read a lot of newspaper and magazine articles about climate change. And some of them have moved me really tremendously, but none of them have moved me over time. 
no matter how much I cared about them while reading them, no matter how many people I forwarded them to and said, you've absolutely got to read this, none of them stuck with me. And I wanted to write something that would stick to me. Um, so I would often, I mean, really at every step, I would, rather than imagining some re other reader, I would just question myself and say, is this mattering to me? Is this persuading me? Is this giving me reason to think about things differently and to make different choices? So that was always my test. And that was the logic that crafted the book. Thank you very much. Question, Ashton. Thank you. Well, that concludes our evening. Jonathan, if we were st sitting together on the same stage with all of these people watching, uh, one of the most gratifying things is to thank you in front of them and to hear them clap. Um, I just have this gut feeling that there are so many people listening to this event tonight who are deeply grateful for the vulnerability in your answers, for, the, for your acumen, and for your encouragement uh, moving forward. Um, I, for one, am thrilled uh, that we got this chance to talk this evening. Uh, I'm so grateful that you wrote, wrote We Are the Weather. Uh, I'm really looking forward to whatever you write next. And I hope that this is a conversation that we can continue into the future. So thank you for being with us tonight. And thanks to everybody uh, who came this evening uh, to the first inaugural Co Common Read event. Um, we'll look forward to having more in the future. And we'll all talk very soon. Well, thank you very much. And rather than applause, I would much rather have you go home and make a plan. And maybe Kyle, there's a way to send it to you and you can send it to me. Um, I, would, I would be extremely gratified and grateful uh, to see those. Okay, so everybody, if you, if you follow Jonathan's advice, hit me up uh, at my email address at ASU is dr.kjensen, J-E-N-S-E-N, at asu.edu. Let's get to work, let's save the planet. Bye, y'all. Have a great night.